Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Nishant Bacha is the author of Mother Ocean Father Nation. He is a writer of fiction and histories. Nishant is the author of the 2022 novel, which I just said, Mother Ocean, Father Nation, and is currently at work on A Bomb Place Close to the Heart, which is coming out in 2025. And that is a novel set between California and New York at the dawn of World War I. He holds a PhD in history from Columbia University, as well as a master's from the University of Oxford on a doctoral fellowship and ESU-SF scholarship, and an undergraduate degree from Columbia. His academic research focused on Indian indentured labor in Trinidad and Fiji. Nishan's writing has been supported by the Headland Center for the Arts and the Prelinger Library, as well as fellowships such as the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. He works as a digital engagement and communications manager for Words Without Borders and lives in Buffalo, New York with his wife and two children. Welcome, Nishant. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Mother Ocean, Father Nation. And I just saw the news about your new book deal. So congratulations on that as well. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me today. My pleasure. Can you please tell listeners what your book is about? Mother Ocean, Father Nation is set on an unnamed fictional South Pacific island nation in the mid-1980s. And it follows the story of a brother and a sister uh, J. Paul and Pumi. And their country is at that point falling apart. There's a military coup that's happening in the background, fueled by a lot of fervent nationalism. And the book follows these siblings during this heady time. And Pumi eventually has to leave the country as a refugee to California, whereas J. Paul stays behind. Interesting. And why this book? Where did this come from? This came out of... Well, first, it came out of a lot of books. I wrote this over (laughs) 10 years, and I think I wrote four or five books to get to this one. I mean, I would write full manuscripts and, you know, abandon them. Usually, there'd be one character or one kernel information that I would find interesting, and that would fuel the next book. It really was not the most efficient way of writing. I can't (laughs) recommend it to anyone. But, you know, I think I have like hundreds of thousands of words on my oh computer that no one will ever oh see. And that is what I was But while I was, you know, writing, experimenting, experimenting and finding these characters, I was also doing a PhD in history at Columbia. And while I was at Columbia, I was writing my dissertation on Indian indentured servitude in Fiji and Trinidad. And so for those who don't know, after slavery was abolished in 1835, the British Empire used indentured Indian labor. So from South Asia, from the subcontinent, they would be sent across the globe to sugar plantations, starting in the Caribbean, but then in the Indian Ocean and places like Mauritius in East Africa, in Southeast Asia, and in the South Pacific and Fiji. And they would work five-year contracts that they could, got, they could knock it out of once, they were, once that document had been signed. And if they wanted to ever go back home, they'd have to work another five years. And so because no one wanted to go back to the sugar plantations after those five years, I was quite hellacious. They would, they would just, you know, end their contracts and they would stay in these islands. That's why to the state places like Trinidad and Guyana and South Africa and Uganda have Indian populations. It all dates back to this. And so that introduced me to this whole Indian diaspora that I knew very little about. And so it was sort of like I was writing a book and doing this research in tandem. And I couldn't, can't say that one fueled the other. They were just sort of both happening and the characters from one would just suffuse through my mind. And and so I think that experience doing research formed a sort of background to this book where the characters sort of emerged as I was doing these, you know, fictional practices, practice runs on novels. So it was, it was a very productive writing time. I think I wrote 
a lot during those years. Oh my gosh. I want to know what, when the moment, like, what was it like after finishing draft three or draft four and being like, yeah, no, this still, this one didn't work either. Like, how, like, where did you get, how did you even get to that point and decide, no, I'm, I'm starting over again. It just would, it would be sort of those, it's like lightning flash moments, you know, it just, I remember I was writing one draft and it was just, I think I was on vacation with my wife in San Luis Obispo in California and it's just like in that, you know, moments of relaxation, you, you're able to unwind. And I think I was just like, this is not working. I need to start over. So I didn't ruin the vacation. In fact, it was quite freeing. It's like, okay, this is what's not working. And here's how I'm going to when I get back home. This is what I'm going to do. And this is how it's going to, this is how it's going to work. My favorite story though, is that when I thought I was actually really done with this book, I gave it to my literary agent, uh, Jamie Carr, who's a wonderful yeah. She's over at the book group yep, yep. and she read it. She's like, oh, it's good. And she never want to hear that. It's just that sort of lukewarm. It's yeah. Good. And then she asked this question because J Paul, who was a major character in the book, she, he was not actually in that draft. And she asked this question, like, what's he up to? The only line about him is that he stayed in the country. And so she asked me, you know, what's he doing? What's happening in the country? What's his life like? And I think, I really resisted that question. I said, oh no, I know exactly what you're asking. And I know exactly what you want. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to write a new book. And then she said, you know, sit with it for a week. And I sat for, I sat with it for a week and I was like, oh, this is the best question because I get to return to the material. I get to see it from a completely different point of view. I get to really explore the ins and outs. So whereas like Umi was written over the course of four or five years, that all the J Paul stuff was written in six months. It was wow. like a fever dream. And like a surgeon, I had to go back and 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 graft him into the manuscript to make it seem like he was always there and make it this seamless narrative. Oh. So that was the most fun revision, I think. I could say it was fun now from where I'm sitting. Oh my god. At the time it was a lot of work, but you know, it, this whole time I've been trying to remember the name of that famous hotel in San Luis Obispo. Wasn't it called like the Madonna Inn or something? Was that it? Yes, Madonna Inn. That's is that, that where you were? Madonna Inn, but that is a very strange <laughs> hotel. I have a postcard from a friend of mine who said he was obsessed with it as a seven-year-old. Oh so my he has gosh. all these postcards of Madonna Inn. Oh my gosh. It's so hot. We literally drove down the California coast last summer and stopped there to like use the bathroom or something ridiculous. And it was like a thousand degrees. We're like, oh my gosh, we have to get out of here. <laughs> Anyway, wait, so take me back to getting started and why you're getting a PhD to begin with. And like, where did your whole career begin? And what were you interested in as a kid? Did you always want to write or were you always into history? And like, where were you born? I don't know. Just take me up to here quickly. (laughs) Well, I was born in the San Francisco Bay Area, grew up in California. I can't say I wanted to be anything growing up. (laughs) I mean, I read a lot. I was always at the library. My public library was like my favorite place from when I was a kid through high school. I would Once I learned how to drive, I'd actually drive myself there every day oh, to so nice. finish my homework and then just kind of hang out in the library until closing. So, How far was the library from your house? Maybe 15 minutes. It was sort of like that California sprawl where yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing is walkable, but everything is like a 15, 20 minute drive. And so I drive from my high school, which is 20 minutes away to the library and then back home. So it's kind of a triangle. Huh. My parents were just, I think they, I look back, it's like, man, I was a great kid. <laughs> Every parent would be lucky to have that kid. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think being a writer or being in the humanities ever really crossed my mind. It just wasn't something that was, that I was exposed to. I was like the only person in my family who read books. And so, you know, my father came to this country in the seventies with my mother and he was an engineer and my mother worked at, has worked at the same Target store in Dublin, California since 1990. Oh my uh, gosh. So there's sort of, there's sort of like a, an inherent stability, don't rocking boat uh, uh-huh. mentality with both of them. It was in college where I first discovered history and the humanities in general. I had come back from a medical leave. I actually was very sick in my first year of college. I had to withdraw from school. I was in the hospital for a while. Um, what happened? I think like what we know now about COVID and sort of post-viral syndrome, it was sort of like I had a flu and then like it just never left. And so I had just this sort of like long illness Ugh. that they had to, at the time, this was, you know, 15, 16 years ago, they didn't really didn't, didn't know how to treat stuff like that. So it was just sort of like, 
wait it out. I hope you get your energy back. Oh man. <laughs> and I eventually did and came back and it was just sort of like, well, what do I do now? I just didn't really know what I wanted to do. It was sort of like my forward momentum that you brought to a hall at age 18. And it was a professor in a history class that I was just took on a lark. Uh, Katerina Pizzagoni, Latin American Civilization One. You know, it was a 200 person class and she pulled me aside and just said, you know, you have a talent for writing. Have you thought about being a history major? And like, of course, I was like star-eyed. <laughs> but, yeah, I was like, I'm going to become a historian. <laughs> and it was on that track. And before I started my PhD at Columbia, I was actually at Oxford in the UK. And I had this summer in between where I had nothing to do. And so I was just like sitting at pubs and writing just for myself, which is what my writing practice had been for a long time. And I had an essay published in this website called The All, which sadly no longer exists, but a lot of writers passed through The All in its heyday. And I thought, oh, people will read my writing. I'm going to write some more. and Maybe I'll start, you know, working on a book or something. And I started doing that more and more. And by the time I got to my PhD program, I was like, I'm leaving. (laughs) Like I, you know, I found something new and I'm going to embark on that path. And I ended up reaching out to a couple writers who I knew had PhDs and asked for their advice. And they were like, just stay. You don't know how good you have it. You've got a stipend. You've got health insurance. You're living in New York. You know, like this is a pretty good life. And so I stayed and switched my research to working on Indian indenture. And, and that was sort of like the, the, I was off to the races from there. And the book and the research really worked in tandem because, because I was doing that, that project, I got to spend a whole year traveling. I was in Trinidad during carnival, met up with some you know, artists and poets there and joined their carnival band and lived in Fiji for several months spent some time in like an archive in Hawaii. It was just this Sounds time. Amazing. <laughs> it, was, it was great. I highly recommend it. And it was also great because I was, you know, writing on the side. I wrote this essay in Fiji about the Methodist church of Fiji. And it was the Methodist church supported one of the three coups Fiji's had since independence. And one of the coups is explicitly anti-Indian. And there was this Indian division in the Methodist Church. And I interviewed members and its leadership asking, you know, why are you here? Why are you in this church? And the answer is that sort of, you know, paradox, schizophrenia of faith, where people, you know, found belonging even in a place that was not necessarily welcoming to them. But that essay really opened up a whole series of questions to me about race, the nation, home. And I think from there, you know, those little novel projects I was working on found a place and the two and it, and it grew in fertile soil from there. Wow. All right. Who are these other authors and did they throw you a book party is what I want to know. Who told you not to quit your PhD program? The authors were the poet, uh, Monica De La Torre, who was then at that point, she was the fiction editor at Bomb Magazine. And I was Bomb's shortest lived intern. I think I interned for <laughs> two weeks. Uh, but in those two weeks, I was able to, to glean some advice from her. And the other writer was the writer, Sadak Abed, who I think teaches at the Eugene Lang School, the new school. And wow. he's written several novels and a great work of nonfiction. But unfortunately, they did not throw me a book party. It's just a sort of, you know, you fall in and out of touch with people. And so these people are like a, a monumental importance at a very key point in my life. And it's just like, I will always think of them as like mentions, but oh. you know, you just sort of lose touch over time, unfortunately. Wow. Well, <laughs> excellent advice. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, my life would not be the same without it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So what is it like now that after all of these iterations of this book to have it finally be what it is and come out and all that? Surreal. I kind of forget that I wrote it. To be honest, I'm a type of writer that just writes and moves on. And so I have to remind myself from time to time that I actually wrote (laughs) and it was published because now I'm sort of immersed in this next book. I gave myself a week between, maybe it was between when I submitted the final copy to my editor at Echo, Sarah Birmingham, and when I started something new. And I think in those two weeks, I was just really sort of restless. Like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I need something to work on. And, you know, I had a... My children are three and 15 months and, Aww. you know, I've got plenty to do. Yeah. <laughs> there was still this part of me that was feeling very restless. And so two weeks after I submitted that, I started this new project. And, wow. That and, was know, so, so tell, tell me more about that. The title I'm forgetting now, it was in Publishers Marketplace, but something that, about a bomb, something. This book is called A Bomb Place Close to the Heart. 
And it's set in 1917 in Palo Alto, California, a strange place to set a book. But in 1917 and in the early 1910s, a lot of Indian revolutionaries found their way to California. Some of them were farmhands uh, in the Central Valley, and some of them were intellectuals who gravitated towards the campuses of Stanford and UC Berkeley. And they were just, you know, as one does, plotting to overthrow the British Empire. But a lot of these men, and they were all men who came, fell in love with American women, with white students on these campuses, and many of them married these women which is remarkable for many reasons. One, interracial was not legal in all 50 states. Two, this was a time of great anti-Asian sentiment. So marrying across racial lines and especially marrying an Asian man can really not only get you in, in social trouble, but as subsequent laws would prove, it would actually, they were at risk of losing their American citizenship by marrying uh, Indian men. So these women who would then themselves join the, the revolutionary movements, you know, loved at great risk. And I remember reading about this and thinking, like, this is, this is like really heady material. And there were like British spies who came in trying to track these men down. And ultimately, after the U.S. entered World War I, many of them were branded as traitors because being against the British venture against the Allies in World War I. So they're branded as German spies. And so they were rounded up and, and a lot of them were deported. And so the book follows an Indian revolutionary and the woman he falls in love with from Palo Alto, and as they are forced to escape, falls in from Palo Alto to New York City and, and beyond during this, I think this period of, to me, great interest and great intrigue that I don't think many people really know about. There are a lot of stories in this time, and I, I'm just so excited to be able to tell uh, a little one in that, in that very interesting part of American history. Wow, it's so great. Oh my gosh, can't wait to read it. What advice would you have for aspiring authors? I think... You know, this is, this is not, you know, very unique advice, but everything boils down to interesting amalgamation of luck and persistence. And, you know, there's nothing we can control about luck. Luck is luck. But the amount that is, of my writing career that has come down to just sheer willpower and persistence is actually astounding. And so I think if, if you're at the very beginning, you know, there's going to be a lot of failure. There's going to be a lot of rejection. And if you truly believe what in what you're writing and what you're working on, all you could do is keep submitting and keep trying and keep sort of like irrationally putting yourself out there and believing in the value of your work because there's many opportunities to quit. And in fact, quitting is the easiest path. But if you if there's truly something in there that you believe in, then it's just going to come down to, to sheer tenacity and grit. All the things you know a parent or, or your mentor figures have, have told us is, is, is important it's actually true like you just have to keep working hard and trying i hate it, when my mom it, is right <laughs> i know isn't it annoying it's just not, <laughs> so annoying. Right. it all comes down to just like working hard <laughs> I was literally just saying to someone, like, I, I hear myself giving my kids the same advice that my mom gave me. And I was like, but I didn't like that. I, you know, but I raged against that advice or I never thought that was good. And now like, that's what I'm using. You know, could I not come up with anything else? It's pathetic. Totally pathetic. But there, <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's timeless. Um, I know. Timeless advice. Oh, well. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on Mom's Dumb Time to Read Books. Thanks for giving me this whole background. I'm totally fascinated. I feel like you are going to continue to find all these amazing little stories and the excitement you have over them is really palpable. So that's, it's, it's great. It's really awesome. So congratulations on your book and I can't wait to follow along with your career. Thanks so much, Sydney. All right. Take care. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 